um, welcome back. Um, good morning again. Um, this is the first panel, and it's going to deal with retail integration, uh, bottom up or top down. I've been working on financial integration since about 2000. I can see some people who are working with me at the time are in the room. And I've always considered retail integration to be the hard part. Um, the rest was not easy, believe me, but uh, this has always been the harder part. And um, before I, I, I you know, open up to the panel, you know, the reason I've always found it to be hard is because there's always a trade-off between financial integration and protection of investors, issuers, protection of markets, etc. This is a, this is a trade-off you have to make. Uh, this trade-off is already difficult in, in wholesale markets. It becomes slightly more acute in retail markets because of the the, the asymmetries that exist, the greater asymmetries that exist. And before I came here, I was reminded that we we recently did, did a consumer barometer an EU barometer, we do these things all the time to see how people are feeling. And the outcome of one of these was that the consumer doesn't really want to go across border. He's not that keen. And the question is, is he not keen because he doesn't want to go or he's not keen because he doesn't know what's out there? And that's always a little bit uh, the question. Another question for me throughout all of this has always been when we're protecting retail investors are we protecting them from risks only, or do we also sometimes protect them from choice? We have recently done a report on asset management, which showed that nominally 50,000 options are available to the retail investor, but that in reality, when he goes to his bank, he's offered three. And typically, there are three from the bank itself. So again, we have to get this balance right between protection and from, and from choice. What makes me optimistic around this area is, of course, digital. I think many of the natural barriers that people like Carol Anu and myself wrote about all those years ago, language, proximity, all those natural barriers, don't seem so natural anymore. Now that you can go on internet, which does not have any borders, you can press buttons that convert this into multiple languages, so you don't have any languages. And when is the last time any of us has been to our bank? I mean, I, I can't remember the last time I've been to my bank. So some of these natural barriers which were always there are perhaps not there anymore. And so this maybe gives us uh, a new opportunity to, um, to think again about retail integration and to perhaps be a bit more optimistic about it. And that's what underlay the Retail Financial Services Action Plan that the Commission put forward recently. This is sort of, we have been here before, we have done these things before, but we're a little bit more optimistic this time that um, we might be able to make progress. So, having poisoned everybody's mind with those introductions, um, I'm now going to hand over to people who actually know what they're talking about in terms of retail, and we have very expert panelists here who will be able to tell us uh, all about the benefits and risks of retail banking integration for the players and the strategies that could make it happen on the needs for further policy interventions, etc. Now, I have 90 minutes for this session, so what I would like to do is to essentially give everybody 10 minutes to, in to do introductions, then maybe come back and spend uh, 20 minutes responding to each other's comments, and then I will throw it open uh, to the audience to um, have questions. And I'd ask the, the, the panelists are going to focus on this. The, the topic at hand is top-down versus bottom-up, which, which is the best way to go here. So before I hand over to them, let me just very briefly introduce the panelists, all experts, all brilliant. Uh, we have um, Victoria Ivashina, who is the Love It Learned Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School. We have Arno Walter, who is the CEO of the online bank Comdirect. We have Monique Goins, who is Director General of the European Consumer Organization. And then we have Jose Manuel Gonzalez Paramo, who is a, an executive board member of the bank BBVA. So all experts in their field are all going to help us to work out the answer to this question. Should we do it, and should it be bottom up or top down? So I'm going to start with Victoria, I think. 
And I have to now multitask here because I have to find your... I was told that I'm the only person who is using slides. I'm feeling very guilty for that, but there are only no. three slides. And the reason I uh, thought I'll use slides is the following. So first of all, it's a real pleasure to be part of this panel. And as somebody who spent a lot of time thinking about the cost and availability of credit, uh, I'm very fond of this agenda of integration. I think it's extremely important. And the steps that have been already made are really impressive. But um, I thought that I will highlight two fundamental frictions and how they manifest themselves in the development uh, of the integration. Now, coming from US, I'm going to allude to US. And also, we brought up US in the earlier panel, in the earlier discussion, as this freak of financial development. So with that in mind, uh, and, and because, of course, of fiscal, political integration, the cultural integration in the past year and a half had been put to test, but I think that we are coming together. And uh, so with that as a background, uh, here is some dramatic facts. So the deposits are very sticky. And this is, uh, relates to the point that was raised by John already, that if you conduct a survey, people are not that eager to switch banks, actually. So if you just take historical information, let's take a two-year rolling window. So then in any given year, within geographical area, the movement between the banks of the market share is essentially zero in deposits. So nobody leapfrogging anybody. And uh, now that's not, uh, that's on average historical, but there have recently been peer, uh, elements, and this is coming from my own research, where we've seen actually movement. And that came in the context of financial crisis where Several banks have been handicapped. Their balance sheet had been severely affected. And so that gave an opportunity for reshuffling of this otherwise very stale movement in the deposit market. So if you look at the period, two window period between 2006, the start of the subprime market to 2008, the gain in the market share is 2.5 percentage points. Still very tiny, but that's actually over one star standard deviation thinking in historical terms. So it's large by historic standards. And then if you just think about 2000 through 2015, uh, in some markets, and there is actually, this is something worth emphasizing because much of the analysis that I had seen aggregates the European markets all together, but actually within US, you can see that there is quite a bit of variation. Not all the pockets of the US market are created equal. And those markets where the where they, where competition was the lowest, you could observe actually the highest rise in uh, market penetration in the deposit market in, in the post period, period, uh, crisis period. So you can see up to 10% increase. But overall, you can see that these numbers are rather low. And it's, it's in line with stickiness. And in the next slide, I will show you some consequences of that. And of course, US also is a nice market in that if you think about 1970s or 1994, there was a wave of geographical deregulation that led to penetration of the deposit market. And the magnitudes are the same. So the punchline of this is that the stickiness is out there. And we should have with that in mind, and given that uh, US is a very particular market where, if anything, you would expect that the flow predisposition of shift, shift banks would be actually higher. Uh, I think that it's, it's good to set some realistic expectation. Now, the reason I'm starting with the deposits, because of course it's not an unrelated point to thinking about credit, right? And so now this points about stickiness translate to lack of competition and deposits, which in turn translates into the cost of funding. And it's been documented that uh, the, uh, it could be as, as the, the gap could be as large as 50 basis points on average. And uh, more recently, I mean, we know that the evidence is in the 10 years leading to the crisis is that the, uh, the the spread that you, U.S. banks get to pay on deposits is actually huge, two percentage points, and it's flat. U.S. monetary policy moves up and down. The pricing on deposit doesn't really move. So, uh, so that's kind of uh, where we need to think about what might make make us move away from that starting point, and uh, perhaps Monique can can provide us insight of how to deal with consumers. On my side, I, I want to highlight the point that also comes from my research in that 
As we gain the market share in the deposit market, it's very important to lock it in. And from the top-down approach, I think that the uh, initiative that comes here, uh, st uh, that seems very important here, is the common deposit insurance. Of course, locally, everybody is deposit insurance, but this cultural integrity in terms of feeling safety of being able to cross open uh, deposits with a foreign bank or cross-border deposits comes out very important. And indeed, in the US context, it's the uninsured part that you can see moving around and uh, affecting the market share. Now, there is a development that's been brought up already several times. Of course, uh, that is a bottom-up development. Uh, a, what came to be known as a fintech and been known before for many years with many other names. And of course, there are many elements of the fintech. Many of them actually are things that we're thinking about and keeping eyes on. But one thing that does bite and is very important, for the same reasons that was alluded already, that nobody here probably uh, goes to the bank anymore to deposit a check, is the fact that the digital experience and its availability and quality is very important for uh, choosing a bank. Now, that's where academics have been lagging in providing good quality research because there is little data. But uh, there are good consulting reports that have been coming out based on the survey data. Building on that observation and, uh, and the magnitude that it's the time period is very short of, uh, over which we can assess the, the, the switching behavior as a result of the retail, uh, quali uh, retail banking digital quality. But uh, we've seen the uptick in the, um, in the shifting of the depositors across the banks as a result. One important observation on the background, however, there is a clear demographical distribution and who tends to, to embrace digital as a factor in their behavior, would they go across the border or not? And that tends to be younger generations. And so if you think about it, of course, the wealth is distributed in the opposite direction. So as the younger generation become older and wealthier, the trend will become, uh, will propagate more actively. Now, less so on the deposit side, even though it is an important point on the deposit side, on the credit side, the tech part, uh, the friction on the, on, the, on the credit side is the information. Uh, and so because any fantastic models that you can build for assessment of credit quality is ultimately depends on the input. And granted that the tax differences, the, uh, the bankruptcy process are all core important ingredients of this assessment of the credit quality, but ultimately so are cultural aspects. And there is a list of them that you can think of. And again, they might be relevant in deposit, but they're particularly relevant in the in the uh, uh, in the credit in the credit side. So a simple question to ask: If you're a German bank and you have you succeeded in building a model, scoring model that is absolutely fantastic in assessing is the credit quality of consumer German consumers or entrepreneurs, small small and medium enterprises? Can you take that model and apply it to Spain? I think there are several people who can respond to this. <laughs> this question better than me in this room, so let me stay away from responding. But if the answer is no, then uh, then the process for this is rather slow because at the bank trying to a German bank trying to enter Spanish market, you would need to first somehow get your hands on that data, on the standardized and quality data, which is not in obvious way achieved through a merger, and that's uh, so. And so this is where a factor of bottom up process slows down, especially on the credit side. And I think that that's where the opportunity for the top down comes in to facilitate this, to focus on the elements of the information that could facilitate penetration of the tech market on the credit side or perhaps on the deposit side as well. Those are my remarks. Thank you very much, Victoria. Um, I mean, this is, is quite interesting because, I mean, deposits were also quite sticky in Europe during the crisis, remarkably sticky, in fact, even during the crisis. And it would be interesting to know whether or not digital will really make deposits less sticky or not. I mean, I, as I said, I don't travel to my bank, but I don't I haven't changed my bank. I just use, use its digital uh, output. 
This brings me then to Arnold, who is a CEO, CEO of a German online bank. So, I mean, you, you know, could be regarded as a, an example of a new way of banking, which is very successful. And many consumers are quite happy now, as we have said, not to enter their bank anymore. So, in th theory, it shouldn't matter whether your bank is, relay is in your country or not. But I think your experience maybe suggests that it might. So, uh, look forward to hearing your comments on that. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, it does mind. Um, so, as you said, um, we call ourselves sometimes one of the oldest fintechs in Germany, as we have been founded in 1994, but for the first 20 years we didn't know that we are a fintech, because then that was a time when the, when the word was invented, so starting at the end of 2014. Um, of course, we are a digital bank and an online bank, and uh, what was interesting for me is um, we did that already, in 1999, we entered three different markets because we thought at that time, after five years of success in Germany, that our brokerage business is really a good one. We chose different ways for the UK, for uh, France and for Italy. And well, three years later, we all closed down. Um, I think one took us until 2004. It was far before my time. So, um, if we talk about retail banking integration, I think you can look at it in a, in a threefold way. If you look at the banking as an institution, I think we have done a very good job, or the EU has done a very good job over the last uh, 10 years. So, we have now much more stable banks. We have done a lot on risk assessment, credit assessment, stability on banks, et cetera, et cetera. So, the bank as an organization, I think we're quite good on our way to have a common European market from the rules and regs we have for the bank as an organization. If you look to the markets, we have just learned that we do progress, uh, but um, I think still some things to do, but I think even there, I think we're on a good way. If I look on the relationship between the bank and the customer when it comes to products and services, well, we, you could even say we have just not yet started to do have a retail banking integration. Um, so what is the problem? Why? Um, we have just been elected as German's best bank by a nationwide test. So why do, don't we do cross-border business? And the answer is very simple because it's still too complex and it still costs us too much money in integration costs. Um, because even if we in, in, uh, use the European passporting, we still need independent solutions for each and every country not only for tax, but for, data protect uh, for, for customer protection laws, for data protection laws, although we do a big step forward now with the new EU uh, initiative, and the legitimation process, uh, everything is different from country to country. So then even if you have pan-European banks today who operate in different markets, what they do is they operate in each and every country with a different set of rules, with different technologies sometimes, and you need all to maintain that and to develop that further. And I think that's one of the, the really big issues we have. And even if we try to do that with, uh, with a bottom-up approach, I think it will never happen. So, because if you leave it to the countries themselves, um, it will take us a far too long time to, to have a really one retail banking market. I will give you a good example for that. Um, so, on one hand, I, I am on a different opinion like you, John, when the 3rd of January for me was a quite important uh, moment because we have 400 agents in our call center and it was an extremely busy day for them because none of the customers of Sol, they, we have sent out a lot of documents. They have never read it and they didn't understand what's happening if we explain them ex ante costs and things like that. Um, they just wanted to do their trading as always and said, why is now everything different? Well, in the meantime, the customer gets used to it. Uh, so, but that is something which was new for the customer. And if I look at MIFID 2 and its implementation, we found now a very interesting situation. And I think the BaFin in Germany is just doing an assessment on it. So if you have a German-based company like Comdirect, of course, we have implemented MIFID 2 with some... Um, yeah, how should I call it, with some additional rules and regs from the BaFin for the German market. If I look to my competitors, and one has a mother company which is located in the Netherlands, and one has a mother company who is located in France, well, we all three have 
somehow similar, but in the end different solutions implemented because all of them were going after the national regulator, how he has interpreted MIFID too. So I think the, the MIFID itself is about, I think, 170 pages or something like that. All documents together we had to look at were 30,000 pages um, with all the additional information we had. So therefore, and if that is true for a German bank, probably will not be very much different for, for a Spain bank. Probably Jose has much more experience on that uh, for the Spanish market. So if we go back, if we want to really have a full retail banking integration, um, and of course, um, then we need more uh, top-down approach and more clear rules and regs, which cannot be changed by each individual country to their specific needs, uh, what they think is best for their customers and for, for their competitions. So final remark on that, um, I always try to find out because you ask if it's, do we try to protect our customers from risk or even from choice? Well, as I'm interested in what's happening around Europe and uh, in new products and services, I always try to open up accounts in different countries. I can tell you, it's just not that easy. Um, to be honest, I think I only made it once. Um, because even, for example, if you go even to the German-speaking country, there is uh, a very famous mobile approach by Erste Bank in Austria, which is called George. It's a fantastic product. I would like, I've looked at it when I was in Austria. I would like to open up the account from Germany, but unfortunately, it's not possible to do so, um, because it's, although it's a digital product, it's still only available in Austria. So, final remark, is it important to have a common European retail banking market. I think yes, for a, maybe a, a totally different reason. If we believe that we just have seen the beginning of the digital revolution and what's happening in, in customer behavior and services we need for the customer, it's always uh, a business of scale. And if I only can implement a solution to some million customers in Germany, which is even the biggest market, um, I don't have immediate access to the other, 200, under, the other one, 250 million customers in Europe. And that's exactly why most of these innovations come from the US or from China, because we're lagging off a large enough market to have a fast development of economies of scale to get your money back from all the money you have invested in new technology. So therefore, I'm a, a, a big fan of a single European retail banking market, but there's still a lot to do uh, for us so that a bank like Comdirect could start cross-border business. Yeah, bottom-up is certainly complicated. Um, we will agree with you. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I said retail integration is always hard, because you are confronted by 28 different national consumer protection laws. People feel rather safe in those national protection laws, and therefore this may also explain why when you ask consumers do they want to go across borders, they say, well, maybe I don't because I feel safe enough in my own and I'm not sure what's out there. So that would suggest that we could move to a top-down approach if that top-down approach can be in such a way that it convinces everybody that they're as safe as they are today. But as you've said in MIFID, top-down approaches that try to do that can also become extremely complicated because frankly speaking, we end up including everything. Yep. We end up with the maximum um, and leaving discretions for people to go even beyond that. So the top-down solution can also be complicated. But Monique is here to tell me whether or not it should be done and how it should be done. Monique. Thank you very much. Uh, it will be a challenge to stick to my 10 minutes because I had a Speech prepared, a, and I had I bell, uh, huh? to respond already to some of this. Yes, I know, I know, I see it. <laughs> so, good morning. I'm really delighted to be here, and uh, also I would say, on behalf of the European Consumer Organization, very happy that we are part of this conversation on a regular basis. Every year we are being invited, and so uh, what I would like to invite you to do is to, with my presentation, to look at market integration bottom up from the consumer perspective, and. Um, what does the consumer expect from a, an integrated financial market, in fact? What's the consumer expectation? And can I just make a little uh, parenthesis? You cannot imagine how complicated it is for a normal person like me to understand your bubble language. This morning, I have been struggling, and I think I'm quite educated, struggling so much with your acronyms, with uh, all those complicated, very, very financially specific uh, language. So, Translate that to the consumer, translate that to the condition and terms in the contracts, and you understand why people are very, very afraid of engaging 
in reading those things. But just that's another way of being bottom up is use the language that is used by the people that you are uh, trying to have as clients. Um, but from the consumer perspective, you, they want easy access to suitable, non-toxic, safe financial e uh, uh, services uh, that, are, that they are able to understand in all their implications. And when things go wrong, they would like to have adequate, easy solutions and assistance. And also bottom up is, and there I would like to respond, when we speak about financial market integration here, what I've heard is the financial institutions going cross-border. But look at the other way around. Look at the consumer going cross-border because the Eurobarometer statics, it was not 100% of consumers who would be able. But if there are even 10% of consumers who are going to shake a little bit uh, the, the frontiers there and the segmentation that is taking place, that might be a, a game changer. And if the consumer is the active one, you don't necessarily need to comply with an with the national legislation in place of the consumer's country of residence. So look at that and from that way, accept customers who come from abroad rather than trying to go abroad. And by the way, uh, speaking about um, consumer protection legislation that might be uh, complex, and, and I can understand that concern, but there has been a study that has just been finalized by the European Commission. I don't know whether it's already public. My colleagues have seen it, which indicates that there is not a lot of examples that can be given by the providers on typical hurdles uh, that exist in terms of consumer protection. A lot has been harmonized. In fact, that's a major, uh, can I say, um, uh, result of market integration. A lot of consumer protection, financial, uh, financial legislation to protect consumers has been harmonized at European level. So there is quite a level playing field there when it comes to the legislation. Where the problem lies, and that would be one of my uh, statements here, is with the uh, enforcement enforcement of consumer rights, there the market integration collapses. So I would like to speak about that, also about market access, uh, a little bit to respond to your, to your question, and uh, on fintech in my last point, if uh, the bell doesn't ring too, uh, too early for me. Um, uh, so what we see is that uh, even if we have a consolidated or harmonized uh, consumer protection legislation at European level, the national authorities are in charge of enforcing consumer protection. Now, there are, there's not one single model of supervision. You have different types of models, one being uh, that uh, the same authority combines prudential control and uh, enforcement of conduct of business rules. And there, uh, let's say, not only is consumer protection the small, the small part of that focus, and not really focused at all. And there can be conflicts of objectives because uh, st market stability and consumer, con uh, co consumer protection can be conflicting. And so we believe that joining um, the, these competences, these portfolios, is to the detriment of consumers in those countries where this combined uh, supervisory authority exists. Then there is the Twin Peaks model, where there is an authority that is specifically uh, designed to protect consumers, so no conflict of interest, specific agendas. We believe from the consumer pers uh, protection perspective that this is the most effective uh, system of consumer protection. Uh, it exists, has been rolled out in the Netherlands and in Belgium, and it's being considered by other countries. We really would like to uh, all authorities to explore this possibility. But then also there are a lot of grey zones where we don't really know who's in charge of protecting consumers. There's a lot of no man's lands of uh, grey zones. And uh, that means, is it the consumer protection authority? Is it the financial? Is it the competition authority? And nobody acts at the end of the day. And what that means is that if you have those grey zones, and this is really a major problem on the bottom of the market integration, is the more the loser, the safety net, the more space for unfair marketing practices and mis-selling. There are a huge number of mis-selling scandals that happen all over Europe. And uh, the timing is not perfect, but in a few weeks' time, we are going to publish, we are going to launch a campaign which we call the Price of Bad Advice, which um, has uh, within its different uh, features a website where we really indicate on the map all the massive mis-selling scandals that have happened in Europe over the last years, where thousands and thousands of consumers have been misled, have had damage, financial damage. Some have been compensated, some are still waiting for compensation, some will never be compensated. You, you, I suppose that you all know the PPI uh, scandal in the UK. There has also been a PPI scandal uh, in Poland. It has taken 10 years before there was one authority, because EOPA acted, 
uh, in order to, uh, let's say, boost action at national level. But between 2005 and 2014, there has been a ping pong battle between the different supervisory authorities in Poland, and no consumer has been helped during those 10 years. Now there has been a recommendation to the banking sector. So that means that this is the type of things that has to be really um, uh, addressed. And we believe that uh, the current review of the um, European super supervisory authorities is really a very important moment where you can improve. You can improve the pro consumer protection mandate of the ESAs. You can improve their resources because that's, of course, the, the most important thing is to have the resources to carry out, to implement a, an ambitious policy. And also to provide them with the mandate to impose binding standards on the national authorities in terms of powers, of tasks, of resources, when it comes to consumer uh, protection. And um, what we also would like to see, and it, happened in another, it happens in another sector, and it's really a best practice, is the ESAs should coordinate and pool national supervisors in order to engage in common activities. There are many, many European-wide, or at least multi-country um, financial problems or mis-selling cases or unfair marketing practices that are addressed to consumers, and they should certainly be addressed in a coordinated way by the supervisory authorities. This happens uh, in the consumer protection area. It's called the Consumer Protection Cooperation Network, where the Commission facilitates the coordination between the authorities. and. As they team up, they have much more power towards companies like Apple, for example, or like rental, uh, car rental companies. Uh, when they, uh, with 27 or 28, go out there, then that is quite uh, an impressive uh, power of persuasion uh, towards the, um, uh, the company that is not complying. By the way, in the new Consumer Protection Corporation regulation, there is also a role of whistleblower for the consumer organizations, meaning that the consumer organizations can flag problems. And we are the bottom organizations. Our members know what's happening on the market, and we, if we can have a space for the authorities to at least listen to us, they cannot be obliged to follow up, but at least have, a, have a, an attention to what we flag, that would be certainly also a way forward. Um, when it comes to the market, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, uh, even if you have a lev level playing field from the consumer perspective, you only can feel or perceive market integration if the market proposes that to you. If you are able to buy f in, a foreign co in another country or from a foreign uh, provider. And, um, what we see there is that there is quite a reluctance to do so. Uh, and uh, you speak about complexity, you, uh, I mean, you speak about the reasons why are we sticky for bank accounts, and uh, there is, of course, a problem of, you. It's, it's some sort of, you know, you get your bank account as a kit, more or less, and then you're, you know, you're very loyal to your bank for, for not necessarily the good reasons. One of the issues is the complexity of changing, or the perceived complexity of switching. Nothing is done to explain to consumers that it's quite easy to do so, and that there is even rules that exist to help you to do so. So nobody really wants to, you know, to, to help the consumer uh, going into switching. And um, uh, this is, and also something there are, tying conditions, and for example, in Italy, one of the mis-selling scandals is that uh, uh, you were tied, if you took out a mortgage credit, you were really tied to the bank account. So this is something that, of course, prevents by cross-selling, by bundling, uh, the, the financial service providers block the consumer in being uh, voting with their feet. By the way, uh, can I suggest a coordinated activity there for the, for the national supervisors? Because we have a payments account directive, which allows a consumer to open a basic bank account in another EU country. So it would be a great, it's not, I can share with you the methodology to do mystery shopping, but do a cons coordinated mystery shopping exercise and try to open a bank account across Europe. And then you will see how the market reacts, because that's a right now under the directive. So normally financial providers could not oppose you uh, not to use that right. And it's not, it's, I mean, you are the active consumer, so no excuse about um, uh, you have to, comp uh, the, the bank has to comply with foreign legislation. No, it's... The, the, the consumer goes to that other country. And I would say this rule, you know, the know your customer rule, which is very often opposed uh, to, by banks to the fact that I'm a foreign customer, so uh, they don't want to uh, open a bank account for me. I only can smile because as uh, you, I have not, not seen my banker since uh, decades, but also with online banking, how do they know their customer? How do they comply with that obligation? So this. Uh, no, no, your customer obligation is a little bit, can I say, fake. My last remark, if I still am allowed, uh, on fintech. Um, I believe it's, it's a huge opportunity 
to in, uh, increase competition in the banking sector. Uh, so it will shake a little bit uh, a too cozy uh, uh, market, and that's certainly a very good thing. So please, uh, we are in favor of fintech solutions. However, it is very important to all not brush under the, under the carpet the problems that come with it, that are, for the moment, out of the supervisory radar of the financial supervisors, being privacy protection, being cybersecurity, uh, especially. And there, what I would like to say to you is, you really have to work out of silos, not only working, uh, when I speak out of silos in the financial area, it could be saying the banking authority has to work with the insurance authority or with the investment authorities or the authorities in, in charge. You have to also work with the cybersecurity agencies, with the data protection agencies, because those, the problems that are for consumers going to rise with fintechs are out of the zone of expertise of financial um, uh, supervisors. And I just saw uh, the video of the European Central Bank about cybersecurity, about the promotion of ethical hacking. Yes, but are we, how many ethical ha hackers will we need to be able to really make the system secure? So I really believe that there must be also an out of silos and a cooperation in s s creating an a overall regulatory environment where consumers can feel safe. And really, I would like to insist on that. Uh, in my work, I mean, I'm not working only on financial services, there are two major global threats. Antibiotic resistance, so not really, I mean, your interest as a per person, for sure, and cybersecurity. I think that cybersecurity has been, and the lack of cybersecurity has been played down by too many authorities. Just put the head in the sand and maybe it won't happen to us. I think that there must be major investments because they can bring the country, the system down very easily. And we have done some life hacking in some of our conferences on uh, Internet of Things. It's very easy if you're just an <coughs> average hacker. Finally, my key message that I would like to, uh, to you to take back uh, from my little intervention is um, very important for ma a market integration from the consumer perspective to have a living playing field with legislation. We are happy that there is already a, a high level of integration at that stage, but <laughs> this will uh, only be valid if on the ground national supervisors are also having an integrated approach towards how to protect and how ambitiously to protect consumers. Thank you. Thank you, Monique. You crammed a great deal into one presentation. I'll be very interested to hear how people respond to the various things. I'm going to respond already in two ways. One is on the, um, the enforcement, which, of course, we think is also very important. But just to make the point that even with EU legislation, even with a top-down, we rely on national authorities to enforce. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the ESA role. I would be interested to see how some people, how member states in particular, would feel about a broader ESA role in the area of consumer protection. We have not found them always so um, enthusiastic about roles in other areas, but that would be interesting to hear. The other thing I came across to me is this idea of the consumer being the cross-border agent. I mean, there are kind of, I can see kind of three business models here for cross-border banking, and this is for you, Jose Manuel. One is what we did before the crisis, which is where banks cross-border lend to each other, and I think that didn't end so well. A better one might be direct lending by banks with subsidiaries inside the, the countries concerned. But now we have a third one from Monique, which says, OK, why can't the consumers be the ones that go across borders? So I would be interested to hear your view on kind of which of those models, if any of them, is the one you think mm -hmm. works best or works least. I hope that you are not uh, expecting that I go directly into this one. No. Uh, okay. But, no. but uh, maybe at the, at the end I can answer you, of course. Uh, but first of all, thank you for ha having me here, and, and congratulations to Philippe and you, I mean, for this uh, excellent new report on financial integration. I think that uh, it culminates a series which is uh, really excellent. If one wants to track the whereabouts of uh, financial integration over the years. And uh, I think the, the focus of this panel is, is, is quite right, uh, because if you look at the indicators that you have published uh, um, today, uh, you see that retail or banking integration lacks the other ones, uh, including, it has improved, of course, but it lacks the other ones, and for, for, for very good reason. So le let me uh, start by referring to uh, the factors that m are behind this, in, in my view, which are not simple, there are many, uh, or the factors explaining the lack of financial integration. Uh, but second, of course, I will focus on a number of factors that impact on the supply 
of funds cross border, and those basically have to do with institutions and uh, the banking union process and the capital markets union, but also on the demand side, you see the decision. And I cannot agree more that this is one of the sources of hope because it's putting a lot of pressure uh, uh, both on legislators but also on institutions in order to raise to the expectations of the uh, new clients. Uh, the millennials, the digital natives, but also the digital immigrants like me, uh, because I've gotten used to to, to this uh, in a way that I could not even imagine a few years ago. So on, on supply and demand barriers to, to integration, I, I think uh, the, uh, one has to, to be uh, careful in understanding why we don't have the degree of integration that we would uh, wish uh, and, and those uh, are not uh, uh, simple to explain. There is not a single explanation that would uh, tell us why the situation is such that many banks in Europe uh, still prefer doing business outside Europe than doing it cross-border within Europe. Um, you see, demand factors, for instance, uh, starting with those, relationship banking still is very prominent. So people feel more comfortable when the bank is closed especially when it comes to once in a lifetime, so to speak, decision, like a big investment, a pension plan, buying a house, and so on and so forth. Of course, this is to some extent cultural, but is there. Second, uh, uh, cultural factors uh, uh, have to do with attitudes towards uh, debt and savings uh, cultures. So there are people that have ingrained in their minds how should they save and, and uh, to which institutions one should direct the, their savings. Uh, uh, and finally, I would mention the uh, literacy, and in particular these days, digital literacy. Literacy meaning what do you know about your investments? Uh, what do you know about the function of the deposit guarantee scheme? What do you know about the function of uh, know your client, of AML, um, uh, the, the behavior of your bank when <laughs> you give them the money? And on the supply side, of course, we have uh, plenty or huge differences in, in national legal and regulatory frameworks. Notwithstanding the, the huge progress that has meant the uh, banking union uh, steps given so far. And secondly, of course, there are problems of asymmetric information, um, as for example, the lack of uh, cross-border access uh, to, to an effective use of borrowers' credit information. And this goes very much in the direction of the example put by Vittoria here. So overcoming these obstacles, which are, as I said, very many, require, in my view, two big efforts. On the, on the supply side, two, in the case of Europe, of course, completing the banking union and the capital markets union, because this would remove a lot of obstacles to cross-border mobility. And I will comment later on the consumer mobility, because this is a, a new experience that we have some. Uh, in, in that connection. And on the demand side, of course, the European banking industry has to raise to the challenges of digitization, which means understand, understanding what is the new standard demanded by clients and transforming institutions from within. It's not just about fintech. To me, fintech is too narrow a concept. Fintech is these small companies that have ideas and maybe they grow or not. Uh, but tech fins are another thing. It's the giants that could become, at some point, financial agents and it's also about banks uh, wanting to transform themselves into digital companies, which is the case of uh, the bank I am I'm, uh, working for. So on, on the supply side and the banking union project, I think uh, it's quite amazing how far have we come from the decision to create the banking union in, in June 12 to the creation of the institution of the single supervisory mechanism, November 14, so uh, slightly more than two years, to the current moment when uh, all efforts are being put in trying to develop a common culture and common standards. Uh, and, and the same goes to the single resolution mechanism has created a function in Brussels, uh, and, and there is now an ongoing discussion, and we are suspended to the June uh, 2018 meeting of the leaders uh, in order to see to what extent they can agree on some roadmap that would include both the backstop for the single resolution fund and the, uh, the uh, European deposit uh, system or guarantee system. But having said that, and, and this is on the design paper, this is quite brilliant. I don't know many countries that have gone such a long way in a short period of time. One has to uh, aside from creating 
and moving fast in the right direction, as, as uh, John said at the beginning. Uh, so setting deadlines for the creation of the backstop and the deposit guarantee scheme and the conditions and the phases to, towards the creation. One has to examine how the different elements of the banking union, as it already stands, have functioned uh, over the period, because we have had some stress tests on, on the banking union, and we by now know that the uh, system has a number of glitches that have to be fixed. Uh, in particular, of course, as regards the single rule book, some say it's uh, anything but single, in the sense that there are many rules that can be interpreted nationally, and gold-plated or whatever you call it. But the, the same directive could be translated in at least 19 ways, if not more, in the union. And this creates a lot of heterogeneity. Um, also, the state aid communication of the Commission, of course, uh, that allows, uh, as it is written now, for different solutions to the same banking problem, depending on the country where this problem uh, uh, pops up. In regards to supervision, of course, we need to phase out national discretionalities. I know that the, the SSM does a lot in trying to interpret in a homogeneous way different legislations, but still, there, there, there is a lot to do in that context. And as regards the solution, there are many things here, including, of course, clarifying how liquidity works, both before resolution and uh, at the time of resolution, because otherwise, it, it, you may be lucky, uh, as uh, we had the experience with uh, a relatively large bank in Spain last summer, but you may not be lucky, and that would be a huge blunder. So liquidity and resolution is one of the pending issues in, in, in in liquidation, and also, of course, looking at what elements in the resolution scheme could trigger deposit runs, because you want to stabilize the system, but you may end up destabilizing it. So pro progress in both completing the banking union, but also in fixing the glitches uh, in, in the banking union as we know it, I think are, are the challenges in connection with the main, I, th I would say, supply factor that is uh, operating. In regards to the capital market union, we, which is where I think the fintech issue f fits uh, best, of course, uh, uh, the, the, there, is, there is a lot to do in order to, to foster cross-border investment and, and the creation of risk sharing mechanisms. Uh, this would be good for consumers uh, and uh, users of finance, like SMEs, because they would have access to more variety and more quantity of funds, and also from the point of view of financial stability. Uh, and stabilization against uh, shocks, uh, it, it would be uh, great. Uh, the priorities, I think, set by, by, by the European Union are right, so promoting the fintech sector. Uh, this is easier said than done, because you have to reach a balance between uh, the uh, developing or fostering innovation, but at the same time ensuring investors and consumers' confidence. Uh, um, so th there are areas of interaction between the new finance and the banking uh, or the capital markets union, like uh, crowdfunding or the use of robot advisors or blockchain infrastructure, which are hot issues as we speak. Uh, I, I will mention also among the many, many other priorities, of course, uh, retail investment. Uh, I, I think it's necessary to, to stimulate or to convince consumers, of course, that there are alternatives to deposits and life insurance policies, which is basically what they do with the money they have, in order for them to participate actively in the capital markets union. And also a new thing, which is very important, sustainable financing. Uh, sustainable financing means at least two things. First of all, financing that is inclusive and second, financing that is uh, aligned to the protection of the environment. And I think that these uh, objectives and priorities are quite right. But the banking union in isolation would not uh, be a great success on, unless the capital markets union also uh, develops. And for that one, current banks uh, in Europe are necessary, if only because they are the most prominent actors in, 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 in place. But finally, digitization. Uh, the, the, this, uh, uh, thing that makes uh, John optimistic and uh, me, me as well, because digitization impacts on the demand for uh, uh, cross-border retail banking. Uh, consumers want diversity of options, they want uh, good prices for their investments, they want, of course, protection uh, for, uh, for, the, for their investments, and digital is a way to provide this. Uh, 
to provide this. It is not for granted because you need to regulate digital in some way. And it was mentioned by Monique before. Uh, many things remain under the radar screen, and I cannot agree more. There is a study of EBA of June last year, which is, uh, in a way, frightening. Frightening because one-third of the startups uh, and fintechs questioned said, OK, I think I'm not subject to any regulation, meaning including AML, a KYC, which is scary, because if this would uh, pop up, it would be terrible. Terrible folly because it means potential problems for financial stability, but also for consumer and investment protection. You put the money in something that you believe is safe, and it is not. It is not behaving by any standard, nor protected by any guarantee funds. And believe me, many people think that going and putting money in, in crowdfunding platforms is as safe and protected as having a deposit in a bank. Uh, so um, l let me just uh, refer before uh, ending uh, in order to develop this uh, regulation uh, that would permit digital to flourish as we would wish in, in Europe, we have to harmonize national requirements in, in, in many respects. Let me mention examples. It was mentioned before, digital onboarding. You see, we benefited a lot from an experience of a German bank. Uh, it was named back then number 26. And we knew that this bank was onboarding clients remotely uh, from Spain to, and, and I guess from, from other countries, uh, into a, the German bank. So we said, okay, we are uh, uh, technically uh, absolutely able to do that, but we are hitting a different standard from the AML authority. So it was great to have this example because we brought it to the M AML authority and said, I mean, these guys are checking on AML, know your client, and they feel this is safe. So why you, don't you, after a few weeks, they said, OK, this is fine. So we are now onboarding digitally, both in Spain and without Spain, clients uh, through this way. But it was, you know, uh, if we standardize this, you wouldn't need to, say, lobby the AML authority just to convince them that this is as safe as uh, what you are doing currently. Uh, some of the things, of course, cybersecurity, this is extremely important. I cannot agree more. In a digital world, Either you are cyber safe with high probability or the confidence of your clients uh, uh, goes away. And uh, this is, if not the end, and at least creates a lot of difficulties for the uh, many opportunities that, that uh, digital opens. Uh, of course, level playing field is one of the issues, and maybe we can discuss about this uh, later on, because for, for the same service, one should expect the same regulation, and this is not really the, 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 the reality, because if you are a bank, you have to behave according to rules that are different from those that are subject to uh, fintechs, uh, so, so to speak. Um, and there is a great challenge for the authorities going forward, because the frontiers are blurring, not just geographically, but also across sectors. So now you think of ecosystems. You think of uh, WeChat. You enter messaging, and then you get offers for travel arrangements. And finally, there is a payments application there. Uh, so that means that the frontier be between sectors is not clear anymore. How are you going to tackle this? Because it's, it's, it's a huge endeavor in order to understand what to do. And I think one of the preconditions to, to tackle this is to have some high degree of cooperation within authorities at the national and the international level. Because otherwise, there would be always kind of uh, um, uh, shopping for the best regulation, and that's a risk uh, going forward. So, well, thank you for this opportunity. I think that now is the moment that the accelerator should be uh, should be uh, pushed. Uh, we should step on the accelerator. June is there. I'm very hopeful. I never lose the hope. Uh, but also my, my, my best uh, or my, my full support to these initiatives and also the initiatives of the Commission in particular and uh, the, for the digital uh, single market. Uh, as well. I mean, this combined, if we succeed to a great extent, I think we'll open a new era for uh, consumers of financial services in Europe. Thank you, Jose Manuel. Okay, I want to give everybody a chance to come back on what they've heard. I'm going to give you a kind of general question around which you can, um, you can ignore it if you wish, or you can answer it in the, in the context of your remarks. <laughs> I mean, I'm a commission official, so whenever you talk about top-down, my ears open because, you know, we are, we are top-down people. But this top-down approach assumes there is such a thing as an EU financial, re retail financial actor, i.e. there's a retail financial actor across Europe 
whose commonalities are greater than their differences. Okay? And that would mean that all these national consumer protection laws don't reflect fundamental preferences. They are simply the constructions of perhaps the way the industry has chosen mm -hmm. to deliver. Um, so it's not so much about protecting customers, maybe uh, protecting retail investors as protecting the providers of firms. But this all assumes that there is, in fact, a sort of common EU retail financial actor. And I was interested in Victoria a long time ago since she spoke now, but you know, the US has a, has a, a reputation of having a very mobile labor force. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that posits are sticky when people are able to move around much more in that world. So is there any sort of, I mean, is there, an, is there a US retail financial actor as well, or are they all also regionally different? So this is just it occurred to me listening to you all that we, we talk a lot about top-down solutions, but these solutions will only work if there is this sort of average EU retail actor who can adva take advantage of this top-down approach. Otherwise, we're going to end up with a sort of 15,000-page, you know, best of the best of uh, class type of legislation. Mm -hmm. So may I start with Victoria? All right. Uh, is there a common U.S. consumer? Uh, if if there is anywhere <laughs> a common consumer, I think U.S. market would be the one. China would be also. Well, China for a completely different reason, though, right? Uh, so, so I mean, the points that came out in the panel, for example, uh, being able to open, a, actually go to a different state or a different area and being open account, that's a known brainer. I don't think anybody perceives us as a friction at all. Uh, and labor mobility, I mean, it's not complete. I mean, it's higher than than maybe in other areas, but I mean, common language, common culture, common deposit insurance, common uh, norms, common law, common service, all those things I think reinforce the common consumer. I, I, I do think that this might be uh, an extreme, yet again an extreme uh, reference, but, uh, but it might be something to look at. Uh, just a couple of comments, sure, more please. broadly. Uh, I cannot disagree with anything that was, that was said, those were very insightful comments, but just to reiterate a couple of things. Since I started, since I emphasized switching, I want to clarify that switching per se, it's a manifestation of a threat, but switching per se shouldn't be our goal, actually, right? Mm -hmm. Our goal is the point that I raised about the fact that lack of that threat and lack of any manifestation of switching, when the switching is at zero, translates to the pricing. And you can clearly see that the pricing on the deposits is uncompetitive in the United States. So that's, that's the point that we should care about, it's pricing, and exactly how ECB measures those elements uh, is convergence on the pricing element. Indeed, the trends that we should look for in the world where we all acknowledge the importance of tech is where the scale actually will matter and the winners likely to emerge are large institutions, our institutions that were ahead of the curve in 1994. So it's, uh, it's it, we would probably see actually bank consolidation as opposed to switching. It's we most likely to see people staying with their, with their banks, but staying for a different reason, because they're becoming more competitive. And uh, a point Jose Manuel raised, which was a very important one and kind of accentuates this inf information asymmetry that I, I wanted to just reiterate. So he said, uh, this when, so, so, so one element is on the supply side, on the banker side. When, being able to process information and great heterogeneity in the information across market, of course, makes that process less scalable. But the point that came out is also on the consumer side, be it the company, be it the, be the, be, be the consumer, in that these are one in a lifetime decisions oftentimes. And take and something I've seen because I, I deal with a lot with private equity, so this is largest transactions, companies that have headquarters in London. When they do the super large transactions, the circumstances about which they're thinking is, what's gonna happen if things go wrong? Who they wanna deal with if things go wrong? They can raise money anywhere. They're completely unconstrained at the moment. But if things go wrong, they wanna make sure that the bankers understand the company. So if I'm gonna phone Italian retail, I wanna make sure that the large fraction of my lenders and my syndicates will be Italian banks, actually. And that's, that's, that's the dynamics that you even see on the, on the very highest end. And just the final remark that, that 
in the way we are emphasizing the technology being a driver of integration, uh, actually, if you go back in the, uh, the literature that thought about the geographical deregulation and following the integration, actually, the very reason for their geographical deregulation was technological innovation of the time. So indeed, this pattern of technological innovation pushing toward integration had been happening in the United States in the 1970s and 1980s already in a different context. Okay. Arno. Could I jump on, oh, no, the sorry. on the stickiness of the process? Okay. Uh, just but you can, you can take everything then. Yeah, this, yeah. this will be well, your. Uh, I mean, I have many reply. notes here, but on, on this. Well, not, not all your notes, but some. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it has always uh, struck me the, the, the stability of the deposit base of the bank. So, digging a bit into it, you, you may find different reasons. First of all, uh, I think consumers might be satisfied with the suite of services that they are getting. And if you look into surveys, especially those taken by uh, some uh, consulting companies, you see that by and large, uh, the confidence of the client is the key. Say, I'm satisfied with the services they give me. I rely on them to protect my money and my data, my data, and this is an underlined uh, uh, um, word. Um, so satisfaction um, with the basics that you are re requesting for a bank may be part of the explanation, and this is why they are competing safely with uh, big payments companies. Uh, 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 still, let's see with the open banking uh, that we're going into, uh, how far can we get here? Second, there may be, uh, there is over-reliance uh, in uh, the feeling of protection. So they say, okay, even if the institution goes under, my money is protected, because people have the notion that there is a deposit guarantee scheme out there. So why should I care? If my bank is good, uh, nothing happens. If it is bad, then the authorities will jump in. Uh, and a third reason, of course, may be um, pure ignorance combined with transactional costs. So if you rely without any reason on your bank because it ha has always done the right things and you are not sufficiently literate about what could happen, then you uh, stick to the deposit in, in your bank. So there are good reasons and bad reasons to, to have this stickiness. The good ones would be, and many banks are understanding this, the only way to succeed in the digital world is to put the client at the center, understanding the standard he or she uh, are demanding from you. And this means using the data you have from the clients, which is huge in huge amounts, with outside data plus artificial intelligence, plus uh, big data techniques and so on and so forth, in order to provide tailor-made services that solve uh, needs and provide value added. If you do that, you enter into a virtuous circle and you keep your clients. But the, the bad thing would be that there are many others that are misinformed or they believe that there is some protection or simply a rule of thumb. Okay, this is, uh, I have always done this. It is very costly to switch, so I'll, I'll stay. I don't know. Yes, um, coming back to your to the question, if there is something like a European common retail actor, I think yes and no. Why well, I think yes, um, because well, now I'm 30 years in, in retail banking, and I've learned from the beginning customers only have three needs. It's quite an easy business because they either need to invest money, they need money as a, a consumer loan or mortgage or they need to transfer money. It's all about this, nothing more. So, by the way, for transferring money, which is the payments area, we have, in the meantime, high competitive markets. We have very good uh, rules and regs for that, and that's probably the reason why Apple and Google and all the other big tech firms have exactly started there uh, for doing their attack uh, about uh, at the banking system. Why uh, I said no, um, well, the behavior we see today, how I fulfill my needs, is probably something which is really cultural, uh, uh, it's cultural based, and probably, um, from my point of view, it's a result of how you have been grown up, what kind of information was available, and was usually information you had from your parents, maybe sometimes from school and teachers and people around you. And now it comes to my out view, and I think that will change because with the mobile world, and we're just at the edge of the mobile revolution, which will probably change even more our lives than we can imagine today, 
Um, if you look at that, suddenly all information is available everywhere. You don't have to ask your parents anymore about a mortgage. You can look at a YouTube video and can get explained everything about that. And people do that. We know that from our tutorials we do with web tutorials. So you have much more information. You can go to a customer protection site. You get a lot. You do social media quite well at that time. You, so you, you get um, a lot of information from the other one. So everything is available now. You don't need, and that will change cultural behavior of customers. And therefore, I think it will help much more against uh, for, for forward to something like a European retail financial actor. Thank you, Arno. Monique. Yes, thank you. Just to react to what Arno just said, uh, I agree that uh, the complexity, the current complexity of the retail financial market is not a consequence of consumer demand. Yeah. People like it simple. People are more at ease when it's simple. Absolutely. So maybe think, maybe make some sort of introspection and make it simple again. It would be also better for the stability of the system, maybe. Uh, another one is about, um, you know, you said you have access to social media to get informed. This is true, but there is also a problem of overload of information and who can I trust? Of course, you can trust the consumer organizations, uh, but uh, of maybe there are sometimes That's other awesome. uh, elements that are less, um, let's say, uh, other actors that are less um, legitimate. Uh, just in terms of... Uh, we do not want to harmonize the consumer. Hmm? That's, let's keep it very, make that very clear. And also, US consumers are not one size fits all. There's a huge difference between expectations from a New York person and from a Montana person, for example. There are also big differences in consumer protection legislation between California and Ohio. There are still, I mean, there are differences, but it's okay. It works well. The system works well. And so what I would like to say, top down or bottom up, I think we don't have the choice. I think that there is enough, even if consumers don't need to be harmonized as such, but there is enough commonality in the expectations that consumers have towards a simple, a safe, an understandable financial system that this can be taken up at the European level. And it is not possible, can I say so, with all the respect for the UK people in this room, it's not possible to take national control back again. This, we are in global markets. Um, global markets will take over. So it's important to have the most global answer possible. We cannot have a global answer. For, so the EU answer is the best possible answer to globalization of our economies. And the huge opportunity that we have here, uh, and, and the, the reason, the historic reasons are there. We have national systems, national cultures, national lobby powers. Uh, but there is a huge opportunity here to regulate in a, in a more, in a, in an area where there is not yet any national tradition, which is fintech. So there is really, uh, let's say, um, a blank page, or more or less a blank page, of course, have that data protection, but that's, of course, already uh, a, a European legislation. So this is a huge opportunity to provide common or harmonized rules, at least, to cater for consumer protection. Thank you, Monique. Now I have, hang on, 15 minutes left for questions from the audience. <laughs> well, I, I will okay. bring you in as part of the audience so you can play a dual role here. So I'll start with Carol. Carol. Thank you for an interesting panel. I'm a bit confused what this panel wants. More harmonization, which I feel a bit through the different uh, contributions, but on the other hand, what, for example, Monique was just saying, no, we need more mutual recognition. And that's where I'm confused. And basically, I believe our consumer integration of markets, but also for capital markets, for investor protection reasons, will only work if we have more mutual recognition. Because our leveling up of harmonization has gone so far, like in MIFID 2, like was mentioned this morning, that we cannot go further. We have to have a new system to reinforce mutual recognition. And that's basically the basis of the screen market. Gentlemen here. Take three and then throw this one back to you. Um, Edouard Vidon from Banque de France. Um, Mr. Gonzalez Paramo briefly touched upon the issue of anti money laundering. I would like, if possible, to hear from the rest of the panel, including from the Commission, to what extent this particular concern uh, makes a difference in the top down versus bottom up uh, debate. Thank you. Thank you. And then one more in this round here. Uh, thank you all for presenting your thoughts and insights. Um, Yuma Brewster from Suede, a regtech firm in London. Uh, I have a question for Victoria on deposit stickiness. Um, do you think there's a difference between countries in the EU on deposit stickiness? And if so, how could this impact integration? 
I ask this because I agree with you that there is definitely a cultural shift within the younger generations, um, as they're, they are much less loyal and constantly seeking kind of the best deals and best better customer service. And for example, the example that I'm most aware of is in the UK, we have the deposit switch guarantee scheme, which makes it incredibly easy for customers to switch um, bank accounts. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now I will start with Monique on mutual mm -hmm. recognition, but I'll throw it open to anybody else who also wants to answer this question about harmonization versus mutual recognition. But Monique. I didn't think that I asked for mutual recognition, so I don't know how you, impl I mean, how you interpreted what I'm saying. I mean, of course you cannot harmonize 100% because you have national situations that you need to take into account, but uh, once you have a really uh, strong EU-wide legislative framework, then the rest can be, of course, managed by mutual recognition, but that slot should be quite narrow, I would say, because it's very important to have a, a, this commonality if you, if you want an integrated financial market. But maybe I've got your, your, your question wrong. Does anybody else want to come in on that? Just very briefly. I think that the risk of uh, mutual recognition is that it consolidates differences. So I would say minimum standards plus mutual recognition would work for a while, but gold plating uh, wouldn't help uh, in order to create a single market. So I would be skeptical to be relaxed about, okay, mutual recognition will solve all the problems. I'm not sure. I mean, competition among regulations is also playing a role. Yes, sure. Sorry, then I have to react, because for me, mutual recognition is rather the other way around. It's not gold plating, but it's, in fact, uh, going down to the lower common denominator because that would be the pressure that would be put by the industry if you accept mutual recognition from a country that has lower consumer protection legislation. Then the national industry is going to tell you why, why should that be acceptable, then bring the national rules down. For us, mutual recognition is, at, in the long term, a race to the bottom. Interesting contrast. <laughs> yes, uh, I just needed to say that. Minimum standards. Yeah, yeah. Just to limit it. Yeah, of course. But all this compete in the other direction, saying your deposit is ultra protected with me, mm -hmm. and they could play with it. So um, is this conducive to a creation of a cap capital markets union, banking union? I hesitate to, well, to I, say I mean, so. I'm not in favor of motor recognition. Okay, I'll come back to anti-money laundering in a minute. Maybe we go to Victoria and deposit stickiness. Deposit stickiness. Um, so the question was uh, to an opinion about how uh, deposit stickiness might vary across the countries. Now, uh, and this simultaneously will push back a little bit on Monique's point in that the Montana and New York uh, depositors are very different. So it's plausible that the French and uh, Italian or Montana and New York's uh, consumers are somehow just of different religions, financial religions. But uh, as an economist, I think that the first order effects are actually more likely to be on, on the rational side. It comes from age, education, income. There is also not to be underestimated the behavioral element that would raised today in the morning about experiences that you had in your country through your families. And we have very nice evidence in the academic literature about how those experiences shape our financial preferences through the life at all levels. So I think if we take those elements, and if you remember those graphs that were shown to us by John actually in the morning, you could see that the x-axis was actually income per capita rate. And this is very much in line with what I'm saying. So I think that if you're going to think, so my answer to that is that I would expect actually quite a lot of variation in the deposit stickiness in the same way that we saw development of financial markets in other dimensions being very different. And again, in looking for the sources of that variation, one, one that was clearly highlighted in today morning was the economic development of the country and, and per capita income, but other elements, demographic distribution, uh, education distribution, before and, and some historical experiences would be important to understand. Things that historical experiences in New York are very different than historical experience in Montana. For one. But national competition is also important. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Which brings us then to anti-money laundering. So I'm going to go down to the table on anti-money laundering, starting with Arno. Um, well, from my opinion, if we look at the KYC process and, and anti-money laundering, there should be only one highest standard in the EU. And I think that is today with a, with a given technology, it would be a problem to really have the same standard across the EU. 
Um, but what we see is that we have different national interests behind it, sometimes different interpretations. So as I said before, so the same way I can open up an account for a German customer is not exactly allowed to do it the same way in Austria, even though we, have to, we share the same language. So therefore, um, I think we really need to standardize And what Jose just mentioned before with N26, we learned at the beginning we had nearly the same process, but we learned that they do something different, and that ended up in a larger discussion in Germany, even to think about a video legitimation should not be forbidden uh, in future. And then, uh, thank God uh, they changed their mind uh, in, in the authorities, so we still have it. But as you see, we have different solutions um, now in Europe, and I think we really need to harmonize that. There should be only one KYC process. There can't be two, there can't be two worlds of anti-money laundering. Jose Manuel. I cannot agree more uh, on, on this one, but if, if you allow me, um, now that I have the <laughs> <laughs> years of my turn, you asked at the beginning, what, what kind of business models uh, for banks you can envisage going forward? Uh, let, me, let me say, because this is a very complex question, we could spend the rest of the day talking about this. But one is, imagine that there is a bank that thinks, okay, this digital thing will take on uh, um, and the, uh, the business, but very progressively, slowly, so you have time to adapt to it. And on top of it, I don't have enough reserves to invest in what I need to invest if I would like to change the bank uh, right away. Well, I think the destiny of, of this kind of banks, the banks that have this reflection, is mm, s slowly or quickly becoming utilities. Utilities with this open banking standard, there would be a platform on which uh, third parties will operate payments and provide services, so you would stick with a less brilliant part of the business, losing contact with the clients and with meager margins. I don't know what size or what percentage of the industry will go that way. Second option would be, okay, no, you have a a vision that the future is digital, so bank, which is a, a knowledge company by definition, should become a digital company, but then you have to uh, abide by this diagnosis, which means uh, identify new competitors going forward, which are not going to be the banks that are sitting with you, but most probably tech companies, uh, uh, be uh, they Google, be uh, they Apple, be they Facebook, be the giants, at some point they will compete with you. They are already competing in some segments. You need to have the money to invest in systems and in skills that are very scarce in the market. So now we don't hire any more accountants or lawyers. We uh, hire uh, in systems engineers. We hire experts in uh, customer experience. We hire experts in big data and so on. Uh, and, and you need to change the organization from within, which is a very difficult part, because changing mindset of the people, making them understand what is the role in the new company, is not an easy, an easy matter. And how you get there, you compete with uh, fintechs, but you may collaborate with them, either because you buy them in order to fertilize your business from within, or you invest in ventures, uh, or you uh, use the incubator approach, so you buy something to make it grow with the internal talent as well, in, in that way. And finally, more ambitious banks, and this is a big question mark, would pretend perhaps going forward to become an ecosystem, a financial ecosystem, or becoming part of a wider ecosystem. And again, WeChat in China is one example of where you could end up. So contemplating these scenarios is very important because the decisions to be taken today uh, uh, in order to, de to, to get to one of these scenarios is not trivial. Very hard decisions to be taken. But I'm sure that a large part of the European banking system would become a utility, which means huge mergers, because low margins call for uh, big size, otherwise uh, you simply disappear. And the others we will see. But think of the challenges for you, supervisors and regulators, uh, or regulators and supervisors in, 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 in your case, uh, as it... Uh, regards financial stability, how to ensure financial stability in an ecosystem world, uh, consumer protection, again, and investor protection, uh, integrity of the system, and then how, how do you do <laughs> AML, KYC, uh, in, in a context where you have a, an institution, not even a bank, offering financial and non-financial services, cross-border, with different authorities worldwide, so, and, uh, integ uh, so integrity, uh, consumer and, and competition efficiency. Okay, the big winner, short term, is the consumer. Long term, we will see. It depends on the protection that they have.
Thank you. I mean, I will just come back on this AML because I think we have to distinguish between AML for the future in digital space, which is going to be itself a particular challenge, yeah. but also AML today, which is a national responsibility under European legislation. Um, however, we have within legislation, you know, the possibility to share information, not the obligation, I would add, the possibility to share information. I think recent developments have kind of led us to think a little bit more about how we can strengthen the centre around AML. It's not necessary to centralise, but I think there are coordination mechanisms across member states, but they're not as strong as we in the Commission think they might be. So we want to explore, and this is for today, I'm not talking about digital, I'm talking about in today's world, we want to look at ways in which we can strengthen coordination among national AML uh, authorities, because that's one area, I think, where having radical differences between uh, standards and implementation of common standards it doesn't really uh, work out if you want to have a, a single market. Now, I have three minutes left. I'm going to allow one more question. Mm -hmm. One more. Maybe my question is very simple because Always uh, the I eat one. a lot. Uh, I'm Simon Houtin, so from Alliance Global Investors. My question is very simple because I meet a lot of uh, management, banks management in my, in my job as an investor, and I have seen close to none telling me that it's a good strategy to go in another country, uh, to opening a new country in, 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 in the euro area. And, and you explained uh, the reasons, I, I think, a bit, but it's striking that uh, we have uh, so many European regulations and so little uh, will to develop outside the domestic country. And what do you think can make it change? Uh, what is the critical factor to make it change? Is it a, a series of, of small actions? Or you could imagine something big, maybe, which, which, which would really change the deal? Uh, for you to, to think about expanding in an other European uh, country? Um, that's a very short question, which will take a very long time to answer. So, um, I'll try with two sentences. Okay. So the first I, thing I give you each two sentences then. Okay. okay. So the first sentence is, if you look today, when you have pan-European banks, it has always been pan-European acquisitions, not mergers. So you have implemented different technology solutions. And yes, tech will be the driver. If we really think about what Jose has just said, if we have platforms and ecosystems with APIs, then probably you can do cross-border business. Very quickly, first, uh, fixing the glitches in the banking union. Second, completing the roadmap was completing the banking union and the capital markets union, and third, regulating right digital. So meaning completing the single digital market. I'm, at this point, I'm going to start repeating the points, but it seems like the, the uh, tech team came out here. It's more than most two sentences already, but uh, uh, this emphasis on tech, it seems like an important issue. I'm just mm -hmm. to reiterate the point. And in order not to repeat what the others have said, just to say, also look at the other aspect, which is make it possible for consumers to go in the, into the other country. There are many, many situations where that might be just uh, the most interesting because you are maybe a German citizen living in, Be uh, in Belgium or in France and you want to go to a, a German uh, provider. Um, just op uh, make this, open this possibility and you, re -def you defragment the market. Okay, and now I have one minute or so left to summarize all of this, so... I'm not going to, um, but I'm just very conscious when I come to conferences like this that we are part of Monique's 10% of people who tend to cross border. And therefore, we may not be representative of the 90% who maybe cross border once a year when they go on holidays and therefore have a less exposure to the world that we live in. That's why I asked the question at the beginning, is there such a thing as it? Certainly here you can see a, an EU retail financial participant, but are we representative of the, uh, the the greater majority. Um, Fifteen percent of border regions. Okay, I suggest we probably are. So that's my answer to that. I mean, <laughs> then on base this discussion, I think we do need to go top down because I think I take Monique's point that bottom up probably won't deliver. Uh, asking member states to coordinate themselves. I tried it with clearing and settlement 15 years ago, and we're still here trying to get it. Um, but harmonizing national systems of consumer protection is not, a very, not, not an easy task. So I think it will 
depend on whether or not you know, this, these commonalities are strong enough, whether these differences really reflect fundamental preferences or not. And if they don't, then we're going to have to sort of identify what these commonalities are and deliver that in the, um, in the EU legislation. The problem with this goes back to your point, Monique, that you know, as far as I can see, the last 20 years of financial services provision has been about tailoring. It's been about trying to provide the client with exactly what the client wants. What you seem to be saying to me at the, re at the retail level, that's not really what the client wants. The client wants perhaps simpler standard products. And that's not the way the market has been thinking, at least up until now. I was interested in this common US law and common frameworks that maybe are more important than, uh, than some more important than others. We in Europe don't have many of those things. We don't have common legal frameworks. We don't have common judiciaries. But we do, however, have the possibility of having a common deposit insurance scheme. I think this may be one of the things that if we can get it in place, will, will help a lot. Digital, I think, offers this great opportunity, I think. We can use it. I think it does take all these natural barriers which we used to stop the conversation about, takes them out. But there, as I said earlier, I mean, we, we need to sort of legislate to allow these digital services to acquire scale. But at the same time, we have to regulate them in a way that doesn't uh, leave the consumer uh, less protected than they would be uh, otherwise. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank Monique, Victoria, Jose Manuel and Arno for great uh, interventions and question answering. And uh, I think I've landed on time, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry to have interrupted you.